Today we're finishing a series that we started a few weeks ago called Rooted, and we're talking about getting rooted in our faith. It's based on a couple key verses in Colossians chapter 2, um, and I just want to start out by reading that uh, for us today to again kind of lay a foundation of why we're talking about this. It says this, Colossians 2, 6 and 7, I believe it is, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Uh, so scripture talks about once you accept Christ, what do you need to do? You need to get rooted in him. And, and it uses this uh, word, rooted, that speaks to, that calls to mind this metaphor of nature. And so we've been talking about that every week, you know, and how nature will prophesy into our spiritual lives. Um, and we've been talking about how when a seed, you know, falls to the ground and gets buried, it goes through germination, it sends out a shoot, and that first shoot doesn't go up and break through the soil, that first shoot goes down, gets rooted in the ground, and that's what prov provides that firm foundation for that plant to grow up and bear fruit and become that new creation that God created it to be. And the same thing is true in your spiritual life. And so uh, we've been talking about how do we get rooted in Christ? What does that look like for us uh, as believers, as a church family? And we talked about week one, talking about spiritual disciplines, right? Daily devotions, going to church, you know, reading your Bible, learning the word of God, learning how to pray, praying often, praying daily even. Spiritual disciplines get you rooted in Jesus. Week two, we talked about the right attitude to have, which is an attitude of surrender, an attitude of yielded obedience. Because you say so, I will. Your, the attitude you have is what, what allows Christ to get rooted in you. Last week, we talked about the importance of being rooted together with a church family. And we talked about how the, the conduit of community in our church is groups. And so super excited that we have 17 groups starting. Plenty of opportunity for you to jump in a group if you want to. Um, and I was praying about uh, what, to, what to speak on this week. And I began to notice the context of those couple verses and the, the context of being rooted in Christ. And Paul was really, really, really concerned with something when he was writing this. And that's what I wanted uh, to talk about today. I want to talk about uh, not only being rooted in Christ, but being rooted in truth. Being rooted in truth. Um, and specifically being rooted in Scripture when it comes to your faith. Um, and so um, I want to start with... Uh, Perhaps uh, a, a sad, somewhat scary story uh, from Scripture about a guy named Nicholas. Um, Nicholas was one of the early disciples in Acts chapter 6, um, verse, verses 3 through 5, where if you recall that chapter, um, well, let me, before we do that, let me, let me set it up this way. Um, you, if you remember last week, I talked about um, the wood wide web. Do you guys remember that? Sound like Elmer Fudd when I say that. Um, and uh, this is, this is uh, the picture we had up here. But I talk about how trees are communal, right? We've, we've thought trees are kind of rugged individualists, you know, survival of the fittest. That's actually not true, that they're communal. They communicate through their roots. They're, they share uh, nutrients and water through their roots. Uh, one thing I didn't mention last week that this does set up where we're going today. Unfortunately, not only can they share uh, water and nutrients and good things through their root systems, they can actually share disease through their root systems. And there are actually some nefarious plants in the plant world, the botanical kingdom, if you will, uh, that can tap into this root system, certain types of fungi and other plants that can poison the trees or cause disease. And if the trees are, are so open that they continue to share everything, some of that poison, some of that disease can be shared and can potentially harm or even kill a tree. And the same thing is true in your faith and in my faith. Uh, and so we have to watch out for uh, things in our roots, our root systems, our, our beliefs that are not of God because they can poison our faith. They can cause our faith to wither. They can, they can get us off track, lead us away from God. They can even uproot your faith. And so... I want to talk about being rooted in, in truth today, and I want to start with this story about uh, this guy named Nicholas. Again, a sad and somewhat scary story for us to consider today. Uh, if you recall in Acts chapter 6, the, the original apostles are kind of overwhelmed with the amount of work because they went, you know, when Peter preached his first sermon, instantly 3,000 people get saved, and then they're like, now what? And they, they're responsible for thousands of people, and 
Most likely, what is a month or two months later, he preaches again and 2,000 more people get saved. These are most likely just counting the men, right? And so it's possible within a few months, the early church was 10,000 people strong and, and the, the disciples are, you know, they're re- giving and receiving offerings and they're buying food and they're trying to make sure everyone's needs are met, which was like a first in history that this benevol- the, the benevolence ministry in this church was just ridiculous. They were meeting everybody's needs. Um, and the disciples get to this point, the, the original apostles, the leaders, they're like, we, we can't keep doing this. We have, we have stopped preaching and teaching, and the word of God has stopped going out. People are, were not getting saved anymore, right, because they stopped preaching, and they were so focused on giving, receiving offerings, and buying the food, and distributing it. And they're like, okay, so you all, the church, select seven men from among you who are wise and full of the Holy Spirit. We'll turn this responsibility over to them, and then we'll get back to the preaching and teaching, which is our and, and prayer, which is our primary, uh, you know, responsibility in the kingdom, right? And so they, you begin to see this this outworking of what Paul expounds on later: the bo- the body being a body, and there's many parts, and we all have different responsibilities, right? And so these seven guys are listed. They are chosen by again. Let me think about this with me. Probably about ten thousand people strong. They pick seven. These. Behind the original 12 apostles, Nicholas is listed as one of the top 20 leaders in the early church. Are you getting the picture of who this guy is? And so he's one of these guys listed in Acts chapter 6. It says uh, they, they tell them to choose some people, and it says, verse 5 there, This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism, okay? Here's the sad, scary part. Nicholas is mentioned one other time in Scripture, uh, referenced, I should say, and it's in the book of Revelation. It's when Jesus is writing to, uh, or telling John to write to the seven churches, all right? Remember this? In the book of Revelation, Jesus uh, talks to John through this vision. He says, write letters to seven churches, and most scholars believe these were actual little ch- literal churches at this time, but the number seven is seven of com- uh, number of completion in Scripture, and it's it's representative of the church down through the ages. And so these letters speak to us for today, which of course was Jesus' intention. And just a side note: when you're reading your Bible, many, many, many Bible verses have double meaning, okay, or double prophecies. They were for that time, and guess what? They're gonna be for another time. The, a lot of the end times prophecies. They were for uh, the judgment on the nation of Israel with the captivity and whatnot, and they speak to the end, end times, right? Um, And so really, really, really important to, to know that. So anyways, he's writing these letters to the early church, right? And Jesus, in each of these letters, he kind of gives an encouragement. Hey, I know your deeds. You know, you work really hard. You've been really faithful. Oh, that's great. Nevertheless, I have this against you. Most of them follow that pattern. And he kind of rebukes the church and kind of warns them. There's some things that aren't good in each church, and he's kind of rebuking them. And in uh, Revelation 2, he's writing to this church. I believe it's the one in Smyrna, uh, but I didn't include that verse in my notes. But he says this, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. So he's like, there's some people among you who are, who are believing some things that aren't good and it's causing them to sin, which isn't good, all right? Now, I wanna point out, these people who are doing this in the church, they're not not believing in Jesus. It's not that they've stopped coming to church and they're like, oh, we don't believe in Jesus anymore, now we believe in this. No, they go to church, oh yeah, Jesus is great, we love Jesus, but we just think it's okay to do this stuff over here as well. Right, And that's the Balaam's teachings. That's what they were doing. They were mixing their Christianity with some of the beliefs of the culture, including forms of sexual immorality that Jesus taught and that scriptures teach, uh, the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament scriptures, which are the teachings of Jesus and his disciples, were not good. And they were, they were mixing these, okay? And listen to what it says next. Likewise, you have also those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So the, he says, you, you also have these people who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Who are the Nicolaitans? Most scholars believe this was a sect 
of Christianity, a, a group of people who believed in Jesus, right? They went to church, believed in Jesus, we like Jesus, we love Jesus, we worship Jesus, but they believed some other things as well that weren't good. Most scholars believe that they were derived from Nicholas, that this, this guy mentioned as one of the top 20 leaders in the early church started to believe some things that were not rooted in Jesus, were not rooted in the teachings of Jesus, were not rooted in the values and beliefs of Jesus, were not rooted in scripture, as we might say in our day and age, because all of those things have been written down now, and that's where we get our Bible, right? And so it wasn't rooted in that, it was rooted in something else, and it led him astray, and he started to say, hey, this is fine. Again, he didn't give up his belief in Jesus. I wanna make that painstakingly clear. But he was saying Jesus, yes, but also these other things. And a whole bunch of people were starting to follow him and what he was teaching, and it was leading them astray. And Jesus said, he needs to repent, they need to repent. Now what's scary about that story, this was a leader in the early church. A man, scripture says, was full of the spirit and, and full of wisdom. I mean, out of 10,000 or so people, he was chosen as one of seven to be, oh, we love him, we think he's so great, but we look up to his faith. Man, his prayer life is just amazing, right? All those types of things. But somewhere he started to believe some things and got off track that weren't rooted in scripture. So what were those things? Most scholars believe they had to do with sexual immorality. Again, forms of sexual morality that were permissible in the Greco-Roman culture of that day that Jesus said, no, we, we don't do that, actually. And scripture's painstakingly clear uh, about sexuality for, for us as people, right? And it's been consistent since Genesis chapter 2, right? In the beginning, God created them. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 19, male and female. And Jesus said, for this reason, because of God's design in gender, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two, just two, one man, one woman, shall be uh, united together, shall be one flesh, which is a reference both to their kinship union as a family and the, their sexual organs coming together, the parts fit together, as I'm sure you learned in grade school, right? And so, seriously, right, we need this teaching today. Jesus said, consistent with the way I and my father designed things in the beginning, same holds true today, and I'm telling you the same holds true today. In the first century, a leader in the early church said, well, you know, I think, you know, we're under grace. You know, we're not under the law. Those are Old Testament verses. We're in the new covenant now. We have grace, right? These are the types of ideas. This is how things start to go. And I just think it's okay. And what was, some scholars believe that what Nicholas was teaching was the concept of open marriage. Like, you can sleep with my spouse, I can sleep with yours, as long as everybody's on board and it's consensual. You know, consenting adults, it's kind of do what you want. And that's kind of the pervasive view of sexuality in America. Sadly, that's the pervasive view of sexuality in the American church. And so I feel a little bit today like God's calling me to be a Gideon, to lead his people, to, to be faithful, to, to lead revival, at least in our area, right? And you know the first thing Gideon had to do to do that and lead that revival? God told him, go to your father's house and cut down his Asherah pole. And so I'm coming in my father's house today and we're gonna cut down some Asherah poles. Does that sound like fun? Um, it's not fun for me. I don't enjoy it, uh, but it is absolutely, absolutely necessary. Um, and so my point is this man who loved Jesus, who knew Jesus, who was a leader in the early church, started to believe things that weren't rooted in God. And they poisoned his faith and they led him astray and they started to lead, he led others astray. Do, do people who lead others astray think they're leading others astray? The vast majority of them, no, they don't. They're deceived. They're deceived. They don't realize that they're wrong, and they begin to promote ideas that are bad, and it, and it hurts people's faith, and it leads them astray. Interestingly, in the very next letter to the church at Thyatira, um, God, Jesus, now think about this. just want to point out, this is New Testament. This is New Covenant. 
This is not the Old Testament God that we think is so mean and judgmental sometimes. This is Jesus Christ who says this. Listen to this. This was going on in the church of Thyatira as well. He said, these are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first, like the good deeds, the good works, uh, being about your father's business. So he's, co- he's commending this church. You're doing a whole lot. You're doing more than you did at first for God. That's great. Verse 20, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. He's speaking of a woman, most likely her name was not Jezebel. This, he's referencing the Jezebel of the Old Testament. She had the same spirit, the same uh, heart attitude as that, as that Jezebel, most likely. But she was a leader, a self-proclaimed leader in this church in Thyatira. Are you getting the picture? Again, another leader. And he said, you tolerate her. And I'm not, I'm not happy about that is what he's getting at. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrifice of idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. Are you catching what Jesus is saying? She's, again, promoting ideas of sexual immorality that are not of God. She, th- she thinks it's okay. This is not someone of a different religion. She is, she's a teacher of Jesus, right? But she's mixing in ideas of the culture and saying, no, that's fine too. Jesus says, I've given her time to repent. He's apparently been warning her. I don't know, maybe through other leaders in the church, maybe through other brothers and sisters going, that's not right. You shouldn't be doing, this is bad. You need to stop. And she's not listening. So listen to what Jesus, New Testament, New Covenant says to her. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will pray each of you according to your deeds. Now, when you read a scripture like that in modern-day American church, there's going to be two heart responses in the people who are listening. I heard one of them because I heard some people go, "Mm." one is fear of the Lord. Wow. Jesus takes sin seriously, doesn't he? The other attitude is your heart gets hard and you go, well, I just couldn't worship a God who would judge people and call someone's children to die. I just couldn't do that. Your heart gets hard in unbelief and you get further from God. Why would Jesus, and I'm, why did I paint that? It's not Old Testament, this is Jesus. Because there's this ideology going on in our culture that Jesus is just all nice and flowery and he's kind and our number one priority as Christians is to be nice. And don't offend anyone. So never talk about what what is truth. Don't challenge anyone's beliefs. You all might be able to get away with that in your lives. As a teacher of God's word, I, I don't have that ability. I have to teach and preach the word of God. And the scriptures tell me there are times I need to warn people. And Jesus is warning his people in, in the early church here. You know, there was someone in the Corinthian church struggling with sexual immorality, and nobody was, nobody cared, nobody said, well, okay, that's fine. You know, whatever floats your boat. Kind of moral relativism at that day and age in that culture, the same in America today. You know, morality is determined by the individual. As long as you're not hurting anyone, it's all consensual. Do whatever you want, right? That type of thing. Um, and that's what was going on in the Corinthian church. And Paul says, this person claims to be a believer, and they're living in a really bad way sexually you need to put them out of the church don't even eat with them because a little yeast works its way through the through the dough right and the church did that they rebuked this like you're this isn't good man you need to stop it and and we're going to put you out of the church nobody hang out with him and they did it and that woke him up and he got convicted and we know in his second letter this guy came back repentant stop doing stop living that way And Paul said, welcome him back with open arms, right? And then he makes this statement. He said, he was handed over to Satan for a time to be taught not to blaspheme. Why? Paul says, God does this to discipline him now, to wake him up so he turns back to Christ, so that he won't be condemned for eternity. 
So how could Jesus do this to this woman Jezebel, who's a leader in the church? How could he discipline her and cause her to, to, to allow her, I should say, to be handed over to Satan and to experience suffering in her body? Perhaps Jesus said he's going to kill her children. Wow, how could he do that? Discipline now in the hope that for eternity she turns back to him and she repents. Are, are you tracking with me? If, if your theology does not allow for a Jesus who has that permission to judge and to discipline in our lives, in this life, then your theology is not based in truth. I didn't plan on talking about judgment today, but let me tell you something. He's still a God who disciplines his people, disciplines those he loves, brings judgments against individuals. Go read what happened to King Herod when people said, you're a God and not a man, and he didn't give glory to God. It says he fell down and died and worms ate his body. What happened to Ananias and Sapphira when they lied about what God was doing in their lives? He is a God who executes judgment, and he has his reasons, and he's just. He's just in them. He executes judgments and disciplines in this life, and we know for sure it's appointed for a man to die once and face the judgment that should, what, what, what do those teachings right there, what, what are they hoping to produce in us from God's perspective? Humility and fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wow. I better take sin seriously. Even after the cross. Even in the age of grace. You know, the spirit of grace. Hebrews 10 says, under the spirit of grace, we're more accountable. And if you insult the spirit of grace, if you use grace as a license to sin, that's when you're in danger of God's judgment. I'm paraphrasing the teaching of Hebrews 10. And you're worthy of greater judgment than those who broke the law of Moses. Some of those were punishable by death. I'm painting a picture for you. God still takes sin very seriously. Why? It costs the blood of Jesus. How could he treat it lightly? When we treat it lightly in our lives as Christians, eh, it's, it's not that big of a deal. We are saying the cross wasn't that big of a deal. Are you getting the picture of God's heart? God's going to discipline this woman because she's causing harm, not only in her life, not only in the lives of her family, in the lives of the church, the lives of the community. Perhaps people coming to faith who think they know Jesus, but if they're buying into what she's teaching, they don't. They're living in ways offensive to him, and Jesus knows for eternity that's not going to go well for them, so he's going to deal with it. It's a good purpose. God is love, but God is also just, both at the same time. Love will tell you the truth. Amen? So, what we believe really matters. So the question I have for you today, what is your faith rooted in? And the popular thing in our culture in American Christianity right now is when we talk about faith, well, that's me and Jesus, my sins for eternity, that's it. And I prayed the prayer and I got baptized, so I'm forgiven and I'm going to heaven. And everything else doesn't really matter that much. Just believe in Jesus. What do you believe about every single aspect of life? What do you believe? about decisions that you have to make? What do you believe about issues in our culture? And what, here's my question. What do you believe about every little thing? Is it rooted in scripture? Or is it rooted in something else? If it's not rooted in scripture, if it's not rooted in the heart of God, then I'm telling you, it has the potential to poison your faith, wither your faith, even uproot your faith and lead you away from God. All the while, in your deception, you think, I know Jesus, it'll all be fine. Whew, man, it's so important. This was Paul's main concern in us being rooted in Christ. His main concern was that we would be led astray by ideas that sounded good because they had Jesus' name thrown in there, mixed in but they actually weren't from God. Listen to the context of those two main verses we've been looking at over the last few weeks. Colossians chapter two, starting out, he says, I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you and all those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. 
My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Listen to this, verse three, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He's, this is a huge idea, guys, huge theological idea. All the treasures of wisdom, that word wisdom, Greek word wisdom, Sophia there, it means not just wisdom for like discernment and uh, decision making like we think about today, what's the wise thing to do, but it also means like all knowledge that everything in the universe is founded upon, science, learning, it means all of that. And then the word mentioned knowledge there actually means moral knowledge, right and wrong. All those treasures of wisdom or knowledge are hidden in Christ, okay? Verse four, I tell you this so that, why is he telling us all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ? So that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments, okay? If I were to tell you that one of the Teletubbies was God incarnate, and he had a book, and you should go read it, and it'll teach you everything you need to know about life. Would anyone believe me and start watching Teletubbies faithfully now? No, no, no one would. Why? It's not a fine, it's not a fine sounding argument. That's not plausible, right? That's ridiculous. That as soon as you hear, as soon as I said the word Teletubby, y'all are like, that's ridiculous. Right? Some of you, when you're kids, you stumbled on Teletubbies and you started watching them. You're like, I hate my life. Turn this off now. Right? You, you, know, how to, you know how to discern truth just from that. Okay. The word fine sounding argument there, it means persuasive reasoning, plausible sound. They sound true. The most dangerous deceptions are those with some truth mixed in. Because the truth is the hook. It's a half truth. Or in some cases, it's like 90% true, except for this one little thing over here, which we modern American Christians go, and that's not that big of a deal, and that's fine. But that can shipwreck your faith, poison your faith, lead you completely astray, cause you to lead other people astray, all the while thinking everything's fine. Fine-sounding arguments. The devil is a counterfeiter, all right? He didn't, you ever heard that joke about um, God and the devil, we're having a competition, let's see who can create something better, and, and, uh, and so the devil s- scooped up some dirt and said, you know, I'll go first, and he scooped up some dirt, and God goes, hold up, get your own dirt. Did you ever hear that? The devil can't create anything, right? He's using what God has created, he twists, everything God created is good, what does he do? He twists it, makes it not good. To lead, he used what God created to lead us away from God, right? He masquerades as an angel of light. You know, chances are, could be wrong, but he's probably not gonna come to you in a red jumpsuit with the little red horns on his head, like you find at Spirit of Halloween store with the little red pitchfork, and, and be like, you should come worship me this Sunday. Why? That's, that's ridiculous. You would never do it. He comes masquerading as an angel of light, holding some truth in this hand, but he's got a whole bag of lies behind his back. He's a counterfeiter. So it, it, this is the illustration God gave me this week for the, to, to help you understand this. Um, if you were concerned that there were reports of counterfeit cash in our, in our uh, community right now. If you stumbled on one of two types, which one would you be more concerned about? If it looked more like monopoly money or more like the real thing? So, like, can you put the monopoly money up there? So, like, if somebody, if, 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 if somebody walked into your store, say you own a store, they walked in and said, hey, I'd like to buy this stuff, here's a... Hundred dollars. a Benjamin right there. I mean, uh, Benjamin's face isn't on it, but just uh, it's a hundred dollar bill. Here you go. You would laugh at them. That's ridiculous. You would think. Why? Looks nothing like the real thing. Now put the next slide up. 
This is actual, uh, an actual Benjamin and then a counterfeit. Can you tell the difference? Which one's real and which one isn't? Very difficult to tell the difference. I, had to re- I couldn't from initially looking at it. Um, I had to read the article, and the article said, the top one is a counterfeit that was you know, uh, taken by authorities in Alabama in 2019. There was a big bust on counterfeit cash. And the top one is the fake. The bottom one is the real one. And it said, notice how the, it, Benjamin Franklin's face in the top one is a little bit blurrier. And notice how the margins in the top one, the top margin is a little thinner and the bottom margin is a little thicker. It's a little bit off. And that's about it. Wow, but it's totally fake. Totally not real. Let me tell you, the devil's good at his job. He knows how to say, oh, you want to believe in Jesus? Okay, that's fine. Um, You can believe all this over here, though. Just mix it in. Just add it in. All that idolatry mentioned in the Old Testament They didn't totally walk away from Yahweh, their God. No, they they went to synagogue faithfully. They just mixed in all the religions of the culture. That's what was destroying their faith and polluting their faith, right? And so that's the same thing going on today. The closer it looks to the real thing, the more concerning it is. And that's what was going on during Paul's day and age People who were believing in Jesus, but they were mixing in all these other ideas that sounded plausible, sounded good, but they were not good. They were destroying people's faith. Verse 5, it goes on. For though I'm absent from you in the body, Paul says, I'm present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, okay, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in your faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. There's our verses. Listen to the next verse. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which is, depends on or is based on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Elemental spiritual forces. What's that look like? Psychology. This is kind of how God made our brains to work. New age stuff, spiritism. A lot of it sounds good. Why? Because it's half true. It's spiritualism without Jesus. There's a lot of truth in it, right? Because this, there is a spirit world and it works a certain way. And you can engage with spiritual powers in certain uh, things that I won't get into because I don't want to teach you how to do that without Jesus. <laughs> but um, yeah, we'll get into it here in a minute. Hollow and deceptive philosophies. If it's not pure Jesus, Christianity, it's hollow and deceptive and it'll lead you astray. So I want to I want to spend the rest of our time walking through, hopefully we'll get through five hollow and deceptive philosophies. Um, I'm going to speed through the first few of this service for the sake of time. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13 says, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Is what you're believing about every issue in life rooted in Jesus, Scripture, or not? Okay? Is every attitude you have about what's going on in the world rooted in Scripture and Jesus and the heart of God or not? Is the attitude you have about what's going on in the world of the Holy Spirit or is it of your flesh? These are good questions to ask. Examine yourself. John 15, 5, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me, I'll remain in you. You'll bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. There's one key difference in all this analogy talk of us being rooted like trees. You have legs and trees don't. So if it, wherever a seed falls, starts putting down roots, it's got to get rooted there for better or worse. But we as people, we can choose to unroot ourselves, can't we? if we want to, and move on. That's why Jesus said, remain in me and I'll remain in you. He's talking about not um, overcoming or overpowering your free will because he free- created you to be a free being in the image of God because God is a free being because love is the highest ethic in the universe. God is love and he created us to love in his image and so we can't love unless we have total free will. And so Jesus wants you to be able to love him back and to receive his love fully in your freedom Why would he say this to the church? Remain in me and I'll remain in you. Well, I'm in Christ. I made a decision. I got baptized one time. Go read Matthew 25. Not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, are going to heaven. 
you got to remain in him. Remain in him. Make sure your beliefs are rooted in the truth of scripture. So, what are five hollow and deceptive philosophies? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I had some other notes about uh, what Paul was dealing with in his day and age. Jewish Phariseeism, which was too strict. It was legalism, adding a bunch of rules that Jesus did not add, right? Um, and they, again, these were guys who were believing in Jesus, but said, oh, you still got to follow Moses and get circumcised and follow the dietary laws. You can only worship on Saturday. You got to do all that still. Paul said that's so serious in Galatians 5 that it, it literally, Christ is of no value to you if you, if you put your faith in that in the law and being like, oh, if I don't worship on the right day, then I'm not right with God. Paul's like, yeah, you've stopped trusting in Christ at that point, right? So Paul was facing that, too strict, and then he was facing all the Greco-Roman ideas being mixed in, Gnosticism and other things that were like, well, Jesus, yeah, but you know, sexual morality, I mean, it's not really immoral if it's consensual, and you can kind of do what you want there. So it was too liberal, and using grace as a license to sin. And as I've said many times, the moment you start using God's grace as a license to do what Scripture says not to do, that's the moment you become in danger of God's judgment, even if you're a believer in Jesus. Mm, it's heavy on my heart, guys. See how that, maybe that's what God wants us to talk more about, is judgment today. Because that, I'm going to get to that a little later on. Um, that belief right there, in America, in American Christianity, a lot of other countries don't have this. You know why? Because they don't have a rich history of faith. They just have the Bible. Like in China, the underground church, they just, they, it just started not, not that long ago compared to American Christianity, right? They just have the Bible, right? And they just read the Bible and they believe it. So they don't have a lot of these issues that we have. And we don't take seriously the doctrines of God's judgment and therefore, we don't have fear of the Lord. Therefore, we think, well, we can kind of do whatever we want. It's dangerous, guys. It's dangerous. So what are these hollow and deceptive philosophies that we're facing? Again, too strict, too liberal. Jesus is the narrow way, right? Jesus, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Make sure you're rooted in him. So number one, legalism. Making rules, this is how I describe this. Making rules the Bible doesn't make. A subset of that in American Christianity is traditionalism, right? You grew up in the church wearing the three-piece suit, going to church, right? And you sing the traditional songs with just a piano, maybe an organ added in for, for some nice pad of texture underneath, right? Um, but for some reason, those are holy instruments, right? Um, but you can't, if you go to a church that uses the drums, whew, sorry, but you're probably not going to heaven, right? Seriously. So... You got to dress a certain way, can only listen to certain kinds of music, only one, we all know there's only one true Bible translation, right? KJV, this is how it's presented, right? If you don't use KJV, hey, you might, a lot of people getting saved and baptized, I don't know, if they don't use KJV, it's not the word of God, and I just wouldn't trust it. All of those things, there's other versions of Christianity, it's like, well, you can only worship on Saturday. There's other ones like, you can only worship on Sunday. We're supposed to be worshiping every day. That's why Paul says, I, I, don't, I consider every day alike because they're all holy days now. We should be worshiping in spirit and truth every day. And so Paul says, do not let someone judge you because of what you eat or drink or because of a new moon or a Sabbath, meaning which day you worship on or because of a festival or a holy day. Speaking of the Old Testament Jewish feasts, and I'm telling you, there are, there are Christians who read the Bible and they, get, they have so much fear of the Lord, they, they, they are so fearful of God that they're like, we better only you know, worship, we, we better celebrate the old Jewish feast, we better, we better do it this way. You know what? I would just steer clear of pork if I were you just to be safe. You know what I'm saying? I'm serious, and we better just worship on Saturday. Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, explicitly says, you can eat what you want. Every day is alike. If you think otherwise, that's fine. Honor God with what you believe, right? He's like, I'm not going to judge you, and I'm not going to judge and look at a church that says you have to dress a certain way and KJV only, and we use a certain type of music. 
if it's working for you, that's great, okay? But I'm telling you, for you, don't let people judge your faith because they're using rules the Bible doesn't make to condemn you because in their mind, they, they think it's true, but it's actually not true. Jesus said of the Pharisees in his day, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. You profess me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Right? You teach us doctrines, meaning the commands of God, what are actually commands of men. One translation says, you hold, you, you hold equal weight of your traditions with Scripture. And there's a lot of that going on in, in American Christianity. All right? It will quench the Spirit when the Spirit is wanting to do something new in a new group of people, and you start going, oh, you can't do that because of all these rules. How you, how you dress, the type of music, the Bible translation. Show me those rules in Scripture. You can't. So that's just your preference then. And we're free, Paul says in Galatians, is for freedom Christ has set us free. We're free to worship God in spirit and truth, kind of however we want, okay? Does that make sense? So that's legalism. Number two, whew, cessationism. This is, there's two types of Christians. Cessationism is the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the miracles, signs, and wonders have ceased. That ceased with the original apostles of Jesus, so it, it helped get the church started. They have all these reasons of why it ceased. And then there's continuation, continuationists. That's us. Okay, that's this church anyways. Um, they, it's, all, it's the same as it was in the New Testament. Everything's continued, okay? Every Christian falls in one of those two broad categories, okay? I would say to cessationists, show me that in Scripture where God says after the original apostles, it's all going to cease. They use one verse that's way out of context and obscure in 1 Corinthians 13, and a basic rule, I didn't even go to Bible college seminary for, for hermeneutics, but I can tell you from my studies that a basic rule of hermeneutic Bible study, Bible interpretation is what hermeneutics means, um, is that you don't use an obscure verse to help you interpret the explicit verses. You use all the explicit verses to help you interpret the obscure verse. So 1 Corinthians 13, where it says, where tongues are, they will cease. Oh, see, the tongues... See, I'm uncomfortable with speaking in tongues because I've never done it and I don't understand it. So I'm a, that fear of the unknown. And so I'm going to use that verse to say we shouldn't be speaking in tongues. <whistles> then I'm going to quench the Holy Spirit. If it is of the Holy Spirit, that's the Spirit of Jesus. Something Jesus is doing in somebody, I'm going to stop it because I have a bad interpretation of one verse that's way out of context. If you read the whole context, Paul says when the imperfect is here that or when the perfect is here, the imperfect will pass away, then we shall know fully, even as we are fully known. Do you fully know God as much as he intimately knows you yet? No, he's talking about heaven. It's obvious if they're being intellectually honest. And other than that, one little verse that's taken way out of context, every other verse in scripture is like, this is how the Holy Spirit works. 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, we should eagerly desire spiritual gifts and grow in them. It is God who moves in you, Philippians 2, to will and to act according to his good purpose. It's the Holy Spirit moving in you to will, to desire. Cessationist churches and pastors, I have a hard time having compassion for those pastors when I hear them complain. Nobody in our church wants, uh, people don't like to work. They just sit there and stare and they, they don't like to serve. And we have to twist people's arms and it's all that. It's probably because you're quenching the spirit in people. It's the Holy Spirit that gives them the desire to want to serve God. And if you equip people, be an equipper according to Ephesians, you connect people to the Holy Spirit, then they get filled with the Spirit. They have a personal connection with God, and they get excited, and they want to serve, and they want to give, and they want to make a difference. They're empowered by His Spirit. It's really important stuff. These are the reasons, I'm telling you. The things I'm walking through are why the church in America is so dead and powerless in our generation and has a form of godliness but denies the power. Well, no wonder God's not moving in power when we keep denying the power. And if you, the churches that do this, just like in Jesus' day, the Pharisees who studied scripture the most said, Jesus, that's not God, that's a demon. 
Jesus said, careful, you're going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit there. And that's an unforgivable sin. Speaking against the supernatural works of the Holy Spirit is the context there. Wow. Be very careful of what you say is not of God when it's especially in the name of Jesus. Because how can you tell a false teacher? Do they profess Christ as Lord or not? It's what John wrote. It's that simple. Did Muhammad profess Christ as Lord? Oh, no. <laughs> no, he didn't. Did Buddha? Nope. Did most other world religions? Nope. Real easy. But certain Christian denominations that you didn't grow up in so you're uncomfortable with, do they? Yes. Well, John would say then it's of God. Maybe they're a little off base on some things, but they probably think you're off base on some things. Be real careful. Be real careful speaking against what you perceive to be not of God. So cessationism, that's a, bit, that's a big one. And I'll, I'll, last thing I'll say on that, um, if you are a person of the word, you will be a person of the spirit. Because the word testifies that we should be people of the spirit. Filled with the spirit, operating in spiritual gifts, especially prophecy, Paul says. That's a big one. Third hollow deceptive philosophy of our age, new age spiritism, that's what I'm calling it. Um, and I'm because I'm really zeroing in on the things that I see in people and in our church, uh, people I've talked to in our church, and it's, it's pre prevalent in our culture. Um, so this is kind of, this is super popular in Hollywood, the music industry, and some of them are like, eight, they don't believe in Jesus at all, and they believe this, and then there's a lot of people that mix this with Jesus. It's like, well, you know, it's like the universe, man. It's like karma, you know, and it's like the universe, and it's like there's a book about it, like The Law of Attraction, The Secret. Did you guys read that book, The Secret? And they made a movie about The Secret. Like, like if you just, like, be positive and, like, focus on, like, what you want in life and be positive about it and go out, the universe will, like, bring it to you, man. That's it in its base form, Right? And don't do bad because it's kind of like karma, man. I'm going to sprinkle in some, some Buddhism in there, some karma stuff. But, like, if you do bad, bad will come to you. And, like, if you do good, like, good comes, man. I've seen it, man. It's karma, man. No, that's a half-truth because that's a spiritual law of the universe that God created. You reap what you sow. And that's true in the natural, and it's true in the spirit. You reap what you sow. Okay? So it's a half-truth. It's Tapping into basic spiritual forces, as Paul said, but you're removing the God who created them. That's divination. Divination. You open yourself up, depending on how severely you get it. It could just be, it's not harmless. It could be superstition. You know, I'm going to wear these socks today. I don't know that just things tend to go better when I wear these socks, all right? Okay, that's kind of somewhat innocent, although I wouldn't recommend it as a Christian, all right? These are my anointed socks. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> Christianize it. But when you're like the universe and the law of attraction and, oh, I'm going to be, yay. If it's not Jesus, it's hollow. An impersonal universe. Let me tell you, the universe doesn't give a rip about you or your soul. The God who created the universe See, when we sending thoughts your way, thanks, that doesn't do a whole lot for me. You want to send some prayers in the name of Jesus because he lives to intercede. And when you pray, my God who rules all things gets involved and moves on my behalf, you want to do that for me? Let's please, 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 please do that. See, our faith is powerful. We need to reclaim the power. How do we do that? Believing it and getting rid of all this other junk that's stupid, hollow, deceptive. Okay, it progresses from there, New Age Spiritism, into horoscopes. You know, what are the stars saying about my life? And what, what sign are you? PCs, Virgo, what month of the year were you born in? Who cares? You'll read some of that and think, well, I'll never become this because I'm, I'm a Pisces. And I'm sitting here going, you think I can't do some of that because I'm a Pisces, but let me tell you something. I'm a son of the Most High God, and I'm going to pray to him, and I'm going to do whatever he wants. And if he wants me to do it, it's going to happen. And no sign I was born under, what month I was born in, ain't going to stop me. 
it's ludicrous. They're limiting beliefs in their most innocent form. You will open yourself up to demonic experience, spirits, potentially, in the more, that's a, that's a greater risk, okay? So if you've ever been to a psychic, tarot cards, Ouija boards, any spiritism that's not Christian, it's counterfeit. People are attracted to spiritism because they're, they're tapping into spiritual power. And there is power there. And demons will sometimes do good things for you, to you, in you, to get the hook even further in you. See, it's a good thing. No, it's white witchcraft. It's a good thing. These are the things I hear, guys. These are the things the culture's saying. It's, a, it's Wiccan. It's a good witchcraft. There's no such thing. The only... Spiritual power that's good is the Holy Spirit power. And let me tell you, it's real. Psychics can have some power. They're tapping into demons who have false prophetic gifts. False doesn't mean they don't work. No, it means they're doing it without the power of God. And they can have some accuracy. But you've just opened yourself up to a demonic spirit. Spirit guides. No, it's a spirit guide. They're positive. They help me. They're helping you over here. They're causing depression and all this other crap in your life over here, but they don't let you know that. The Holy Spirit can give you power to prophesy too. I've experienced that. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's like, wow. They're like, how'd you know that? You said this was going to happen in my life, and it did. Oh, God's real, and I love Jesus even more now. How'd you know that? I didn't. I felt like God was telling me to tell you. Wow, that's cool. That's what the Holy Spirit power gifts are for, to build up faith, especially in our day and age. We need them even more in a culture that doesn't even believe a spiritual power exists. Oh, let me tell you, he exists. And then when he moves in that way, for you to do that in someone's life, and they go, oh my goodness, he does exist. Yeah, his name's Jesus. The Bible's true. You should get to know him. That's what it's for. That's what it's for. All other spiritism that's not Christian Holy Spirit is a counterfeit. You are opening yourself up to the demonic realm. So if you've ever engaged in all that, you should go to um, Open Heavens, um, Open Heaven Ministries Deliverance Prayer Training. You'll learn about it. Um, and then their prayer team can pray with you through those things. If you've ever especially been to a psychic, engage with Ouija boards, any of that kind of junk, Wiccan, even just, well, I read this little thing on the internet and I did it, like a little incantation or a little, basically a prayer, but it's not Christian. Yeah, you should renounce that in the name of Jesus because um, it's very possible you've gotten some demonic attachments through that. So, um, number three, and man, I'm going to have to end this real soon. Uh, for the sake of time. So I'll make these last two together because really uh, they go together. Secular humanism, which is the basis for progressive Christianity, which is number five. These that I've mentioned, they get more nefarious as they go because they get closer to what it seems like. Uh, it, 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 you, throw, you mix Jesus in with them and you're it's getting more and more deceptive as it goes. Okay, So secular humanism is... Uh, secular humanism is atheism, but it's we as people are inherently good, and if we work hard enough and work together and be positive, we can fix all of our own problems, all right? Um, and so you mix that, that. That's the problem, and that's what has led to progressive Christianity in our culture because we are a humanistic culture, moral, moral relativism. Every, every individual gets to decide for themselves what is good, good right, and true, um, you're, you live your truth, I live my truth, and let's just, as long as we give each other that space, then we're, we won't offend each other, right? That's kind of the attitude, that's what that looks like. Um, except if you know truth, and you know that's going to harm them, if you really love them at some point, you'll talk to them about that, you know? So anyways, secular humanism, and we all grow up in it, right? And we, we grow up in an atheistic culture that's humanistic, and you throw in some of that new age spiritism, the universe, and just being positive and, and, and spiritual things that aren't of God. You mix that in. That's the religion of America. And by the way, 
of all the people in America who say they are not religious at all, 70% of them say they believe in a higher spiritual power. Very, very spiritual culture. Very, very spiritual world we live in. Um, but they just don't accept that it's Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and his word is true, right? So we grow up in secular humanism. We grow up in an atheistic, you know, uh, moral relativistic culture. And then you get saved and you come to church. But what you need to realize is you, because you grew up in it, right? That's the lens that you even view your faith through sometimes. And then when you read scripture and you look at the world and then you hear me speak, and because I speak the Bible, you get real uncomfortable. But then you go, I don't know about that because I was so uncomfortable, right? I don't know if that makes me feel very good about God. So I'm going to go research on the internet and you find other Christian teachers who tell you what your itching ears want to hear because it makes you comfortable because you never have to change and you would never have to tell someone that they have to change. That's a real comfortable, convenient faith, isn't it? And your sins can be forgiven forever and you never have to change and nobody else ever has to change and I, I never have to stand for God and I never have to maybe say something that will offend people who don't understand and, and then they would persecute me. God forget, for, forbid people think less of me because I love Jesus and they don't understand, right? And now you're starting to paint a picture of American Christianity right there. Because we're reading scripture and we're coming to church with this lens of secular humanism and moral relativism on. Here's the deal. When you read scripture, if you're a Christian, it's the word of God. It's the word of Jesus. It is true. And if you're going to follow Jesus, following Jesus means you humble yourself, humble yourself, and say, I believe this is true. And if I don't understand it, maybe that's an invitation to a journey to seek him more and to seek answers and come to understand it. I'm telling you, every single time I thought I've seen a contradiction in scripture or something that didn't make sense, every single time I go, Lord, give me understanding. And I go research it, and I research both sides, and I research the heck out of it. And oh my goodness, guess what? There's a deeper understanding of God waiting for you. Perhaps if you don't understand it, or it makes you uncomfortable, or it just doesn't make sense, perhaps it's because he's God, and you're a human, and his thoughts are not your thoughts, and his reasons are not your reasons, and his ways are not your ways. It's an invitation, though. He wants a relationship with you. It's an invitation to know God in a greater way. Don't rely on yourself. And I'll close, it, close, close this out today with this. Don't be like Thomas Jefferson. You know, a lot of our founding fathers were devout Christians, and Jefferson was an extremely learned man. Uh, many degrees is how we might say it in our day and age. Extremely learned man. And he read scripture, and he liked Jesus. He liked the moral teachings of Jesus. But because of his great learning, he just couldn't accept the supernatural aspects of life or scripture. So he literally took a razor and some scissors, and he cut out all of the supernatural aspects of the New Testament. He cut out the supernatural miracles of Jesus. He cut out, tragically, the resurrection of Jesus. And he said, there, that's my God. That's who I believe in. And that was his private Bible. It's been, and he didn't, people didn't know that for years. He read that privately. That was his private scriptures that he read for years and years and years. And then when it became known, and of course after he's died, it's become known as the Jefferson Bible. It's this Bible that he cut out all the stuff that he didn't like, and he said there. You know, Paul says, without the resurrection of Jesus, our faith is of no value. I'm not his judge. I don't know where he's at for eternity. But I wouldn't want to be him. Taking a razor blade to Jesus' word, that's a spirit of pride. That's not a spirit of humility that goes, man, I'm just a person. What do I know? I'm going to humble myself. Because God gives grace to the humble. He gives favor, help you understand. He gives wisdom to those who ask. You know what God does to proud people who say, well, I just think. He resists them. He opposes them. He disciplines them. He humbles them in the hope 
that they'll repent so that he can save them for eternity. I don't know about you, but I don't want to experience God's discipline in this life or the next. I'm going to humble myself. I want my faith to be rooted in the word of God. 54% of, of American Christians believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. And therein lies our problem. I didn't say Americans. I said American Christians. That means 46% believe, eh, it's not really the inspired, like, inerrant, like, word of God. And therein lies the problem. Do you believe Jesus is who he said he is? Jesus believed the scriptures were the word of God. And the New Testament is the word of Jesus. You believe it all, or you're in danger of shipwrecking your faith. It's got to be rooted in scripture. It's a song I really like. Last thing I'm going to say. It's a song written, released in this last year. It's called, I Want to Serve God by Sam McCabe. And the chorus says this. I don't want to follow a God that's always on my side trying to enshrine my disposition and call it the divine. When the clouds come rolling in, who's really leading who? Do I want you to look like me or do I want to look like you? Let me tell you something. You can't define who God is. You don't get to define who God is. He is who he is. I am that I am, says the Lord. That's his name. We don't get to define him. We can only discover who he is, and then choose to worship him or not. He's revealed himself through history. It's been recorded in his word. His word and our faith are deeply rooted in reality, history, through many evidences, miracles, and many, many witnesses. His words are trustworthy and true. So let's humble ourselves, worship him for who he is in spirit and truth. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for our time together today. I just pray you get this word deep down in our hearts. I pray that if any of this is challenging for anyone in this place today, you would help them to humble themselves, to repent of any false beliefs, ideologies that are not rooted in your word. To ter- Repent means to not just feel sorry for, to turn from, to renounce, and to say, you know what I believe I'm going to trust God, and this is what his word says, even if it makes me uncomfortable. And so, God, I just pray that we could have that attitude, that bent as a church, and uh, I just pray that we could have true faith. And uh, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for your discipline. We thank you for your correction at times because we know it is what's best, and you do it because you love us. And so we just open ourselves up and invite you, Lord, to say, search us and know us. Um, Help us know to examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith in every aspect of our lives and if there's any aspect we're not god that that your spirit would convict us and you're so good you don't just convict us you show us how to step out of it or what to do next and uh and we you're you're just so good we just thank you for that lord and i know you're going to do that god i just renounce any plot of the enemy to make anyone who has a humble heart who loves you feel fear feel more fearful than they need to fear over this message. Maybe I'm not living good enough for God or I don't believe good enough or true enough. And I just renounce that uh, lie and attack of the enemy. But I do pray for those who have taken things too loosely. And I pray for deep conviction, true, lasting, deep repentance in Jesus' name. So that your word says so that we could all be unified and built up in the faith and strong and rooted together. And... um If there's any of these false ideologies in our church, God, I just pray you'd root it out and deliver us and uh, help us to have faith, uh, faith in your word, faith that can move mountains, faith in your Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.